Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's Wednesday Wisdom Program featuring Laura Shao. Before we begin, we would like to share a video from our sponsor, GuideHouse. This is GuideHouse. We work side by side with our commercial and public sector clients to address their most important challenges by advancing strategic thinking and building trust in society. Our national security segment transforms our nation's greatest emergency management, homeland security, diplomatic, law enforcement, and intelligence community challenges into opportunities. We work side by side with federal agencies to optimize mission operations by defining a vision for the future, a strategy to achieve it, and a plan to measure impact. The future of consulting lives here. Please welcome INSA's Executive Vice President, John Doyen. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Wednesday Wisdom. We're pleased to welcome one of the community's top leaders to the program this afternoon. Before we get started, let me make a few housekeeping notes. First, we hope to keep this session as interactive as possible. So if you'd like to submit questions for our speaker, please do so using the Q&A tool on the right side of your screen. We have more than 500 people registered today, so we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Secondly, I would like to remind everyone that this um, session is open to the press and we do have members of the press attending today. So this program is on the record. And lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsor, GuideHouse, for their critical support of this program. We could not deliver this type of thought leadership without the support of partners. Now I'm pleased to welcome Paul Lingholt, who is partner for the national security segment at GuideHouse introduce our speaker. Paul, over to you. Thank you, John. I would like to thank INSA for hosting this program and the tremendous work they do producing these vital conversations. GuideHouse is a long-standing supporter of INSA. GuideHouse has been supporting clients across the intelligence community for decades. Our teams deliver accounting and financial management solutions, strategy and organizational excellence, open source operations, as well as some really innovative data science initiatives. We are proud of the deep relationships we build with our clients and our staff enjoy opportunities for growth, and development and advancement. Now it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker. Laura Xiao is the Chief Operating Officer of the ODNI. In this capacity, she is responsible for the strategic management of the office, including corporate governance, financial operations, information technology, security and counterintelligence, and talent management. With more than a decade of service at ODNI and two decades in the intelligence community, Mrs. Xiao has served senior leaders in the Department of Justice and the FBI and has a strong track record of leading collaboration across the IC on high profile topics, including counterterrorism and China and fostering a corporate culture of workforce engagement and professional development. Previously, she served as the Deputy Director of National of the National Counter Counterterrorism Center from April to October 2020, and as NCTC's Executive Director from March 2019 to April 2020, where she managed the center's financial and personnel operations and helped drive information technology innovation. Welcome, Laura, and thanks for spending time with us today. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction and welcome as well to Laura. We're so glad to have you with us on the program this afternoon. And um, nice, and to begin the conversation, um, uh, maybe we should start with uh, talking about what a chief operating officer uh, does at the ODNI. So perhaps you could share with us some of your roles and responsibilities of the COO and uh, uh, what challenges you face. Thanks, John. Well, first of all, um, I've had the honor of working with John before, just uh, so everyone knows, and he is a great mentor and problem solver. So it's really a, a great thing to be interviewed by someone that you respect so much. So I'm happy to be here. Um, 
I think Paul's intro did kind of a good job of talking about the many business operations pieces that fall under a coup. So everything from IT to human resources, uh, security, finance, all kinds of things. But I think the main and most important objective is just to ensure the smooth functioning of the enterprise. Um, fortunately, I have a great team of experts in all those areas to rely on because that's that's great because my background is mostly on substantive issues. But the places that when I came over into this position, I could really jump into and add value right away were um, internal governance and workforce engagement, especially in this past year of all years, emphasizing the importance of diversity and inclusion. Um, our organization, as probably many people who are watching today are tracking, uh, has gone through quite a difficult period, not just the pandemic, but many other challenges we faced in leadership turnovers. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, with all that happening, a lot of governance processes and communication had fallen by the wayside. So I was just very fortunate to be able to energize transparency and workforce engagement from my first days, uh, really trying to emphasize a culture of corporate service, finding ways to empower our workforce uh, and to, to allow them to feel like they can be part of the change they want to see here at ODNI. But I will also say that my most uh, area of emphasis and, and time investment has definitely been in the pandemic response. So my organization, NACU, also manages preparedness and mission resilience. And so you can imagine uh, all the things we've done, safety protocols, uh, managing building occupancy, trying to make people feel safe, and also most recently rolling out the vaccine to our workforce. So, well, going back to something, Laura, you just said, talked a little bit about leadership transition. Of course, you uh, at ODNI, you've had your own leadership transition. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how it was for you having been so much a part of the center, one of the ODNI center, the National Counterterrorism Center, and your transition up into um, the role you're in now, the chief operating officer role? Um, any surprises for you in that transition? Well, sure. So I know John knows all this, but uh, just to kind of explain for everyone listening today, NCTC is the largest part of ODNI, but the workforce composition is very different. So I think when most people think of the ODNI and its predecessor, the community management staff, they think of a very senior oversight organization. Um, but ODNI for the past five years uh, has used NCTC as the hub for its entry level hiring program. So more than half of the workforce there is sort of at the junior grade level. So it's a really different dynamic. Also, I'd been home based at NCTC for the better part of a decade, so uh, I knew everybody on pretty much a personal level walking through the halls. Uh, and as I kind of alluded to before, my transition came in a year that was marked by a lot of turmoil. Um, not just because of COVID, but because we'd weathered so many transitions here, um, including about a year ago, actually, a year ago this week was when I became NCTC's um, acting director very unexpectedly when the top two um, officials at NCTC, uh, my friends and mentors were removed. Uh, so we had a line of succession, I think every organization does, and I was number three in the line of succession, but I think that I had thought that meant, you know, when people had leave plans or went on foreign travel, uh, I would be acting director for a bit of time here and there. I was never expecting to have the, the honor and the responsibility to do that for um, six months and a really tough six months because all of those changes coincided with the day that the U.S. government drew down its posture related to COVID. So quite, quite a memorable week about a year ago. Um, and so I, I never would have expected to find myself in that role. It was certainly really a very challenging time, but I will say that that experience and the very challenges themselves have sort of galvanized within me this passion for being an advocate for the IC mission and for its people. And so when this chance to apply for the position of chief operating officer came up, even though it hadn't really been part of my career plan, I thought it was the place where I could best serve as an advocate for the workforce um, and for the mission of the IC writ large and to just do my level best during the pandemic to try to protect our people. Um, so the largest surprise I think was that when I came over, you know, I know uh, ODI and I, it's a very broad uh, mission and um, certainly there, as I said, there's some different dynamics in terms of grade structure and things like that. But I, I didn't realize that really everyone needed to hear the same things. Uh, so it was actually not as much of a, of a, a different um, kind of thing that was needed for me than what I had been doing at NCTC, especially over that last summer um, and into the fall, which was just to try to ease people's concerns and the existential fear that I think we all felt as human beings during the pandemic, constantly scared that we were gonna lose the people that we loved, but also uh, to really make sure that the workforce, which had a keenly felt need to be reassured that the IC's mission was important and that the work that we do um, is valued and appreciated by our leadership and that, uh, there's this element of our work 
since it's a classified nature, that's always going to require us to be essential workers coming into the SCIF. We, we just don't have the luxury of being able to adopt a lot of these, the best safety protocols of telework and other things. And so to be able to let people know on a regular basis through human engagement that everything they were doing mattered and was important and it was worth the sacrifice and that this country needed them. So um, I think that my first, my first uh, couple of months, November, December, were really just about human engagement on classified conference calls so people could dial in from home, social distant walkabouts, listening sessions, town halls, all the things you could think of, every way to engage. Um, and then just to hit this message, right? Because I think sometimes people um, lose sight of, especially when there's public criticism about, about ODI and what it was created to do. And I am a true believer in that. I'm a true believer in the fact that we are here to build bridges. And when, except in a pandemic and under so many difficult con conditions, would you possibly need to build bridges more, right? And so just ensuring that we were messaging that again, we're here, we're here to help. We're here to help the, the make sure the communication and the information sharing is occurring across the community to make sure that the whole community is working with unity of purpose. Well, that's, um... I think that uh, speaks to a lot of the strong leadership that you you show, and um, that's great that you uh, were able to take those experiences from NCTC and, and lead, and now you're in the current role you're in. Um, one thing you mentioned, Laura, you said something about uh, looking across the intelligence community writ large, and um, that made me think, to what extent, you know, as a chief operating officer, uh, I guess you take care of all the uh, daily things that are going on within the operations of the ODNI, but also what's your level of involvement in the business of the broader intelligence community? Well, so you, you hit it on the head, right? Because the job is sort of just to do all the things, whatever those things happen to be on, on a given day. Um, but it's one of the, the privileges, especially right now, since we don't have anyone in the Principal Deputy Director for National Intelligence, Principal Executive Role, um, is really supporting uh, the DNI and her engagement in IC governance. So that's the executive committee that she le leads and the deputy exec executive committee, the XCOM and the DEXCOM, as we usually refer to them. Um, certainly, there's a lot of you know day to day involvement and. In, uh, looking at NSC packages and all of the other taskings that come through ExecSec. But I think one area where in this preparedness and mission resilience space, we've been able to do quite a lot of community leadership within the coup is just trying to make sure that the community is cross-talking during the pandemic. And it, it was about 13 months ago when Odie and I stood up an incident management team, which not only plays a function in sort of coordinating as a one-stop shop, all of the efforts that are happening here in our enterprise, but all of those around the community. And that includes data. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have a chance later for me to speak to the, the power of data when it comes to solving big challenges, which I believe in very broadly, but certainly um, in the context of trying to, to um, handle the pandemic. And so we were drawing information from around the community on the building occupancy in different facilities, on the safety protocols and best practices that were being utilized, on the case numbers themselves and the quarantines associated with potential exposure in facilities. Uh, so all of that data, and then more recently vaccination data, so that we can provide that and package it as a service for the community to make sure that our congressional overseers are also um, very knowledgeable and aware of what's going on, and also to keep the executive branch and the Office of Management and Budget well informed. Okay. You're thinking about, you know, so ODNI has grown uh, from where it was uh, uh, many, many years ago in a diff sort of a different uh, um, uh, construct as a community management staff. But uh, today it's a, a large organization. It has many different pieces. Um, what have you found to be the most effective ways to coordinate the priorities and initiatives uh, across that diverse organization? Well, I think it's worth noting, and I said this to you before we got started today, that we're we're kind of the size of a large high school. So um, we're still on the small side. You can know everybody, and that is certainly helpful. Um, but humans are humans, so we still have sort of the same uh, challenges with communication and working with unity of purpose that you would expect. Uh, and also, if you're supposed to be leading the community, I think it's uh, incumbent upon you to model the good behavior that you want everyone else to demonstrate as well. Uh, so just talking from a big picture first, um, I think it just works best when the strategic direction and the priorities are flowing from the top. Um, you know, the administration's national security priorities are then folded into the IC priorities 
the IC priorities feed the agency level priorities. And then by the time we get within the agency to the smaller components and directorates, I like to think of it as, you know, it's our responsibility as leaders in those organizations to sort of do the bespoke tailoring of those priorities in a way that's going to be very, very meaningful to the person who's the practitioner, who's actually doing the work of the mission every day. Um, and to make sure that all of that is underpinned by a set of core values that we constantly communicate and echo. Um, obviously, I've seen this done. I think we've all seen this done in ways that work well and ways that really don't work at all. Um, but I do think that there are leaders that I've had the privilege of working for who are really gifted at making it look seamless. And when it looks seamless, the end result is not, you know, a lot of fancy language or or a problem that people can repeat. But it's really just that people are behaving with more accountability and there's less churn and confusion in the organization and what's supposed to be happening there. And people are just have more of a sense of purpose and focus and are feeling their impact. Um, I guess this past year, so many things happened. And as I said, a lot of our internal governance processes were not there because of the pandemic and other reasons. And I know in the past, before the pandemic, we used to complain a lot about meetings. Oh, there's so many meetings, there's so many internal governance meetings. And um, no one complains anymore. I mean, most of our meetings are virtual, obviously, but everyone is so engaged and so happy to just have a return to structure um, and a return to predictable process and routine that I, I think we are at least gonna get a nice period of a few years here where nobody is complaining about meetings and when we can actually have meetings in purpose uh, in person I can't even imagine how grand that will be I look forward to, to that although I've gotten very used to the to the looking at the video teleconference screens and even though you know when these are classified video teleconferences we can't do funny things with our backgrounds we still uh, find ways to have amusing items in our backdrop and <laughs> you know we're still having fun with it mm -hmm. Well, that's nice. Well, that kind of gets me into uh, the next uh, topic I wanted to talk touch on, which was um, sort of resiliency and resiliency within the intelligence community and particularly ODI. and i um, So, you know, we've all, uh, you know, been living through the, the pandemic here for a year plus now. Um, what are, do you, do you have some uh, lessons learned at this point is one thing I wanted to touch on. And then also I wanted to get to a topic that we always get a lot of questions about which is the whole set of issues around remote work and okay. what you've learned about that and what, what lies ahead for remote work. So if you could touch on those things, the lessons and also the, uh, remote work. Okay, well, I know um, we're, we're low on time. So I'll touch on just two of the lessons learned. Um, I will say that we used to make this comment uh, a lot. There's no handbook for this. And so I'm actually working on a handbook. <laughs> I hope this never happens again, but um, if it does, I hope we can share some lessons learned. And so I alluded to one earlier. I think the first lesson learned for us is let the data be your guide and be transparent with it. So we were able to do a lot of data-driven analysis, mapping out cases among our personnel and the IC tenants who are in our facilities, the cases in the area, the hospital bed availability near our area, um, and to make the case for drawing down our staffing posture right after I got the job in kind of the November period, right before Thanksgiving. And I think that it's just very important, even if there's questions of how we can get the mission done with a smaller building footprint for instance, mm -hmm. for instance instance if you can reassure leadership by actually showing those graphs and charts and then more importantly aggressively sharing that with the workforce so that they understand also and they feel like you're not hiding things from them and I think we all felt um, at different points like there just needed to be more transparency in terms of what was going on and so that has been a very impactful um, thing that we continue to do in sharing vaccination numbers and charts um, of those who've been able to to uh, receive the vaccine. So the second thing, I kind of touched on this before, and it applies to the whole IC, is just we have a no-fail mission in the intelligence community. The main portion is classified, of course, which means that we're going to be essential in pandemics or crisis situations. And, and none of us does this mission for public glory, because um, we know that our greatest achievements are probably going to need to remain secret, at least for many, many years, maybe our lifetime. Um, and so I think that the ethos of quiet service outside of the limelight is heroic in and of itself. Um, but we need as leaders within the IC to make sure that our workforce knows that their sacrifices are valued. Um, that they deserve big thank you signs on the side of the road and they deserve balcony serenades even if the nature of our work means we can't have that kind of public recognition and so finding ways to do that on a regular basis uh, to keep morale high when people are dealing with so much stress um, and, and still coming to work every day and putting in their best effort great um so on just to touch again on remote work um do you think that um that's an area that 
the ODNI and perhaps other parts of the IC are going to start to embrace more as a uh, a part of um, you know the business of the intelligence community, um, uh, working on unclassified networks, or potentially maybe even one day having uh, secure uh, platforms that you can use outside of SIFs. So we are really excited at ODNI because uh, we're kind of at the finish line of a permanent telework policy that's not related to the pandemic, that's going to outlive um, all of the current crisis and puts into place a whole realm of procedures and coaching for managers on how to create work agreements for employees. We think this can be a really powerful tool also for recruitment, right? Because you can look at a job and you can say, we are going to devote X percentage of time mm -hmm. to being able to do this in a teleworking space, which I think just has, you know, a, a tremendous um, ability to help people beyond the pandemic when we're still going to face work-life challenges. But some of the other things that we've been able to do and which we want to keep going um, in the in the silver linings realm are to use the telework as a way to get people involved in corporate service and to work on workforce initiatives, to contribute to employee resource groups, um, to, to do all sorts of enrichment activities and training and to find ways to map that out smartly and have folks work with their supervisors to plan those things and build them into sort of their, their work plan for the year. Um, so right now we're creating a kind of a, a space where all kinds of initiatives within the ODNI can be posted so that if you have a particular portfolio and it doesn't lend itself to doing part of your job outside of work, you can sign up for these range of activities and trainings. You can maybe get a little training and do some cross-pollination and find out about another mission area that you wouldn't have had exposure to otherwise. And I think that also can be really powerful when we talk about managing a career at ODNI and having mm -hmm. folks you know, move around the enterprise and get a, a variety of different experiences while they're here. Okay, there's, I wanna to touch on a, another set of questions about diversity, but before I do, I wanna remind it, folks, we'll get to your questions uh, shortly. Um, uh, and if you have them, please use the tool to uh, send them on in. Uh, and um, so let me go ahead. You had mentioned uh, briefly, Laura, um, employee resource groups as something that might benefit from uh, remote work or the ability to work uh, um, on unclassified platforms. Um, and I know that there's a great uh, variety and uh, a robust effort of employee resources groups at the ODNI, which makes me think, of course, of diversity issues. And I wanted to ask, um, what is the ODNI uh, currently doing uh, to promote diversity inclusion uh, both at ODNI and then throughout the the IC, especially in light of some of the, the priorities from the White House, uh, for example, the executive order um, on to advance advance racial equity uh, that was one of the first ones signed by the president uh, back in January. What is ODNI doing uh, in this lane? Well, I think the first thing I want to say is just that you know the DNI came in right away and made this a priority. Um, and she's doing that at the executive committee at the XCOM level, which she leads for the community to make that with all of the other principles an area where we're going to make real progress and, and get engaged. Um, but from an ODNI agency only perspective, I'll talk about some of the things that we've been doing. Um, I was very honored to get to stand up for the first time in executive, executive diversity council back in February. And I mentioned um, hosting listening sessions. Uh, I had hosted several on race and social equity. And I think that these are things we need to keep going, especially right now uh, in light of what we've seen in the last couple of weeks with violence towards our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. I think we need to, open the aperture and have as many conversations and get people involved. Um, just personally, while we're on this topic, I do want to say that from the perspective of the national security enterprise, I think we just need to be constantly vigilant, that nothing we do can be perceived as furthering any kind of bias or discrimination. And as someone who worked counterterrorism, I just think frequently about what happened in this country after 9-11 and the tremendous discrimination that many of our Muslim American and South Asian uh, individuals of South Asian descent experienced. And I just hope that we will never again create any conditions for our national security challenges to be used by anyone, anywhere as a, a way to justify any kind of insensitivity or ignorance. But I will highlight one one thing I wanted to share. You know, we just had our IC diversity awards and our DNI spoke there. And I think she made a really powerful comment that I wholeheartedly agree with. So if it's okay, I just wanted to share that with everyone. Uh, she said, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people has a unique responsibility in a democratic society to reflect the population we govern. It's a moral imperative 
by the strength of ability and content of character alone, a person should be free to chart his or her own path in our nation and here in the IC. And so we all know that diverse organizations and organizations that are inclusive are smarter and stronger and better prepared to adapt and more innovative. Um, so I think that this just has to be an area where we're asking all of our employees, not just leadership, not just diversity and inclusion professionals to get engaged and be part of the solution. And I talked a bit about the entry level program that is run through NCTC for all of ODNI, and I just want to share a vignette there. So through outreach and recruiting over that five year period, we were able to increase the diversity of our applicants by 700%, 700%. But how many people from that number do you think could wait around for you know years to get a security clearance? It's just not tenable, especially um, people have loans, especially after a pandemic, it's not tenable. So I would really love, and one thing we're really going to work on this year, but we need to do it across the community, is to focus on initiatives that change that, right? How can we bring people in to do unclassified work while they're waiting for their clearance or maybe at the secret level? I think there's so much room for innovation and our IC Human Capital Office is a collection of initiatives called the Right Trusted Agile Workforce, which are phenomenal and are all about getting us there. But I'd love to see all the energy surrounding this be turned into some real and actionable change in the near future. That's great, Gax. Actually, the, the question I had teed up for you was from a State Department person as we shift to some questions from our audience, Heidi Panetta, who had asked, is the ODNI looking at security clearance reform especially as it relates to diversity and inclusion. So on the reform piece, um, I think it, it, there's you know, wide agreement that we're not where we wanna be. Um, are there any new reform initiatives that might be underway? Well, so I think the reciprocity is a very important one. Mm -hmm. And then part of the Right Trusted Agile Workforce that I mentioned is this ability for individuals to come in and receive one IC credential and move around and potentially in the future be able to also go out and do externships, uh, leave the government, go to the private sector, maintain their clearance and be able to come back in. I think it's just important for us to remember that the expectations of officers joining the workforce today are not necessarily to stay in one agency for 30 or 40 years but to be able to have a dynamic career. And at ODNI, where we're supposed to be convincing people that the strength is to be a joint duty officer who identifies as an IC officer first, I think it's even more important that we put a lot of these steps in place to make that a little bit easier for people. Okay. We have a couple of questions um, uh, that are similar. One, uh, for example, is submitted by both by uh, Teresa Smetzer from Salesforce and Chandra Osan with the federal government who want to know about priorities. And they ask, uh, what are the ODNI uh, strategic priority priorities um, uh, for this year, and and uh, what are you looking at? Well, so I, I don't want to uh, scoop our boss, who's going to be rolling out her priorities here uh, in the near future, but I can talk mm -hmm. a little bit about some of the priorities that I have in the coup office, um, and that is really to empower our employees, as I said, to get involved in the change that they want to see here at ODNI. Mm -hmm. So we put in, in place um, and are currently building out a little shop that's basically an innovation hub, and the whole idea is that any officer can have a great idea and then have a resource where they can come and bring it to fruition. You know, bureaucracies, right? It's difficult sometimes to navigate. How do you propose an idea to the corporate board? How do you write a good white paper? How do you move that into the policy coordination process? How do you bring it all the way up to the DNI for? for signature and turn a bill into a law, so to speak, and actually then write an implementation plan and get it to work. And we've had so much grassroots involvement over the years. I think some of the best achievements and things mm -hmm. that we've done have been from officers who just felt a need to, to uh, seize the day and take an initiative. And so I'm very excited that we're gonna be using our cross the line program, which allows any officer to kind of raise their hand and move about the cabin, so to speak, uh, go to a different part of the ODNI and get some additional exposure to help enable this and to allow them to, to come and tackle on some of the things that are on the that that have already been proposed by awesome employees are things like handbooks for new parents uh things like sponsoring a high school i mean just like lots of great ideas and i think sometimes in a in a bureaucracy those things that that enthusiasm can get stifled but one thing i will say we always uh, had from the early days at nctc was this ethos that mike Leiter gave us which was we can be a dot-com startup which i know is such, such dated terminology now <laughs> but um but i love that that energy the cre the creativity uh -huh. and the fact that you know in innovation in this space that i've created 
the idea that we're going to fail sometimes is fine. We're going to try things out and then some of them won't work and maybe some will get folded into another pilot course or a workshop on a different issue. Um, but the fact that we at least have created a safe place where we can do that and try to um, advance a lot of grassroots ideas. I hope that okay. um, another question here um, is from John Rosenwasser, who's with the Senate Intelligence Committee staff. And he asked, what is ODNI's plan for growing a cadre of officers who have entered in the junior grades? Um, this is great. It's nice that John is asking a question. <laughs> I, I, get to, I get to work with John a lot and it's always a pleasure. He knows a lot about ODNI because he used to serve here. Um, but you know, this, this thing I mentioned, five years of bringing in talent and how do we keep and maintain that talent? And also that talent has a mandate, a congressionally directed mandate actually, to do joint duty within their first few years so that they're not sort of just in the ivory tower, um, but they've been out and they've done rotations to operational agencies and gotten a broad exposure to the intelligence cycle. And so how do we do that smartly? So one of the things, and those who've been exposed to the military will, will remember what a detailer is, right? This is a person who knows about the options that are out there who works with you and coaches you months in advance of the next time you're going to rotate to discern your interests and to find a good match. And also, I think it's very important, you know, not all of the experiences that we send our junior officers out on in this JDA space are going to be successful. Sometimes they may not have a manager in that organization who's going to give them the coaching, the one-on-one -on -one time that they need. Um, sometimes the environment just not might not be the best for them to thrive. And so to track those things and to make sure that we are constantly improving and only sending our folks out on the JDAs that are going to be most beneficial. So I actually um, have a job posted right now to create that space. Um, and as, as John, as you're familiar, and many others are, a lot of organizations have a senior executive management office, right? They're helping all the seniors go out on their joint duty assignments at senior schools. Well, I think one of the big thoughts is we need to put the same amount of love, time, and attention into our junior workforce, maybe a little bit more because we want to retain them um, and get them to, to call all the friends they meet on these JDAs and say, hey, have you thought about coming over to ODI in a rotation? It's a really great place. So, hey, one of our listeners uh, here is, says it's John Negroponte is listening today, and he has a question, which uh, is a question you've probably heard before about the size of the ODNI. And he says there's been he notes there's been some criticism uh, that ODNI has been described as a bloated bureaucracy. He says that they were just saying that uh, back at the beginning of the, the ODNI as well. Um, can you address that and give us some ground truth? Well, so I think we have a really elegant structure right now, which I think can help to ease some of those concerns. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of these things are hardy perennials. Uh, first of all, sir, thank you so much for listening to my Wisdom Wednesday. That's extremely flattering, <laughs> but I won't be too much of a fangirl. I will just uh, answer this question. So the, the thing that I would say is that our structure right now is two directorates, two main directorates. So mission integration, which is sort of focused on current analysis and assessments. Mm -hmm. That's what PDB lives, that's where the NIC lives and other things people are very familiar with. And then uh, policy and capabilities, which is really about driving the IC towards future change, right? So that's where S&T is housed. A lot of the innovation work, the IC human capital initiatives that I was talking about, the IC leadership that needs to be done to get us not just where we need to be today, but where we need to be 10 years, 20 years and position us for the future. In addition to those two directorates, we've got three centers. We have NCTC, which I've talked about because it's my, where I was from for a long time. We have um, NCSE, which is counterintelligence and security, burgeoning issue, uh, very important, very important portfolio at this time. And we have the National Counterproliferation Center, which was also called out in the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act that created the ODNI specifically. It is um, a very small shop of amazing expertise that drive action in that policy space across the whole community. So we have those three centers and then some small enabling offices. Uh, so that's things like strategic communications, the folks who are helping me uh, be able to be here with you today, uh, legislative affairs, things like that. So uh, I hope hearing about kind of the the way that we are structured helps people to realize that there there's you know a few different ways in which you can lead the community where we're not um we're not a, a massive enterprise full of redundant functions in fact we're always asking ourselves well how do we add value in this space how do we bring people together facilitate information sharing help solve problems great hey well there's another question here from uh karen wagner who uh, has a question about uh, the National Intelligence University, 
uh, which some people may not know is also a part of ODNI. How is that being integrated into the ODNI staff? So, so the NIU is not with us yet. They're still with DIA, but hopefully very soon they will be making their transition. I'm actually going to be um, speaking over at the NIU next week. They are located on our, one of our campuses, though, um, and we are very excited to have them join the family. Um, the the director, uh, the president of the NIU, uh, Dr. Scott Cameron, is someone who uh, we worked with, John, at NCTC for a long time. Um, he is so passionate about everything that can be done in the space and making NIU a resource for the entire um, intelligence community workforce. And I think that his energy and enthusiasm has gotten the DNI to be in exactly that mindset. Uh, so we're doing a lot to roll out this transition. And as you can imagine, for the employees of the National Intelligence University and its current students this year. There are just a lot of things, certainly falling on the coup organization that we are, are working through to make sure that they have an easy transition um, to our computer systems and other things. But I am very excited about it. And I uh, have long been someone who always volunteers to go and teach whenever I can. And that's one of my, my favorite places to visit. I think I'm on the docket for mid-April as my next appearance. Nice. Thinking about um, uh, getting them up on your computer systems, brings us to a computer related question. Uh, Gabe Alex, who's with Applied Insight asked, how do you see uh, CIA's new commercial cloud enterprise improving some of the challenges uh, that ODNI faces? Well, I certainly think that our ICCIO would be the best person to answer that question. Um, but I will say that I think, you know, as the community is working together, and as I said, we have this important function that is to, to make the community function in an investment space with unity of purpose. So to look at the critical investments and to decide how we're going to do that together uh, to avoid any kind of duplication. And when you talk about IT initiatives, that's that's the big ticket in terms of funding, right? And so it's more important than ever that we have an ICCIO whose job it is to work with his counterparts around the community to sort of prioritize. And a lot of that has happened as a result of, you know, C2S in the cloud. Okay. Thanks. We have another person who is uh, in the audience who's written in and asked, uh, how can someone from industry, how can industry people uh, do an externship with the ODNI and others to get some experience and learn how the government works? So we don't have that program yet, but it's something we're excited about. We want to build. It's very much a part of that right, trusted, agile workforce I was I was speaking of. Mm -hmm. uh, I would encourage that person, though, to, to visit dni.gov, to check out intelligencecareers.gov, and to look for potential opportunities. And certainly, um, you know, that's where we'll be posting information as we do sort of change the way we do business and move into offering some of those kinds of opportunities. Great. Um, here's another industry uh, flavor sec. Um, question, and it's from Thomas Toyama from San Jose uh, and works with Apple. He asked, how can and should the IC collaborate with the private sector better? Oh, it's a fabulous question. So I think that, you know, partnerships is an area where we have much work to do. Um, I think that sometimes in, in this space in particular, um, I think that as a CT community, as a counterterrorism community, we were making those strides early on to do the engagement um, and to make sure that we can help be a resource because the ODI, I mean, one of the nice things about the ODI, right, is that we are not an operational agency. We are not coming with an agenda. We are coming to foster information sharing. We are coming to try to build bridges and communication. And so um, I think that it's a really important role for ODI to continue to play with the private sector in multiple sectors, you know, not just the, the sort of, you know, the tech sector, but certainly there, it's very important. And I'm very excited, you know, some of our, our partners who do more of the, the hard line S and T development have been able to create so much space and collaboration. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily an ODI and I bailiwick because again, our role is sort of to coordinate that and make sure that those efforts can be exposed to the whole community and that the community can participate. But certainly insert in terms of building bridges and doing the education and being a resource, I think that that is one of our um, you know, important roles in the partnership space and an area where I know that my colleagues in policy and capabilities are continuing to focus their, their efforts. Great. Well, I know you to be a great mentor. Um, and so here's a career question from one of our listeners who works with GuideHouse and named Jake McGill. And he asked for some advice. He said, what, what advice would you give to young professionals who are just uh, starting their careers in the IC today? 
Well, I think that I would say, you know, it's good to have a plan for your career, but it's also very important to have a sense of adventure and to listen to your mentors. Most of the coolest things I've done have all been because someone came to me and said, I think you should try this. And I can be way too timid. And many times I pushed back like four or five times before I was finally moved in that direction. Um, I had the honor and privilege really early in my career of uh, going to work for Director Mueller as his briefer and then staying on to do executive intelligence support and you know in that space I met a bunch of luminaries I met people like Lisa Monaco and Matt Olson and John Carlin all these people I look up to and I had no idea then in my 20s that I would be working with them through National Security Council projects or working for Matt when he was the director of NCTC but the, the fact that um, I was like, oh no, I can't do that job. I'm not good enough to do that job. But my, my mentors and my colleagues were like, do it, do it, put in your application, go to the interview. And so I would say that, that you should trust the people who know you well and take the risks and the opportunities. Um, I think you should, Take that sense of adventure too and going exploring the rest of the community i know that the joint duty program sometimes gets some criticism i don't see it that way at all even the joint duty assignments i had that were really tough and difficult to adjust to, to, to cultures and uh, work with partners i was unfamiliar with all made me a better person and at the end of those when i would come back to my home base and I would go back to being a manager and analyst i always found that i was better and it was life-changing and i couldn't look at things things the same way. And so I also believe, you know, we, um, whatever our professional work role is, we should sometimes get out of that comfort zone and understand the rest of the intelligence cycle. So, right, professional analysts here. So getting out to the operational agencies and seeing how different collection focused missions are done was life changing for me when I came back and, and uh, returned to my sort of normal role and comfort zone um, as, as a bookish analyst. <laughs> Great. Hey, uh, another question, we're getting short here, but I can try to get a few more questions in. Uh, another question is from Melissa Stivaletti with Booz Allen. And Melissa asks, how do you envision the organization of OSINT or open source intelligence in the future? Well, this has been a topic of a lot of community discussion, and I wish that I had an answer for Melissa that was, we've got a plan, we've got it all figured out. One thing I can say, though, is that at the at that deputy level, at that deputy XCOM level, um, there have been a number of conversations this year where we could at least level set and understand the different challenges that the parts of the IC are facing. So we are moving towards having a great answer to Melissa's question, but right now I think we're still in the phase where we are trying to capture sort of the, the requirements and challenges that we're all facing as individuals individual agencies and then figuring out where we're going to go together as an IC. Great. And I think we have time for one more question and I'm going to ask one that came in from a guy named Jeff Levine. And Jeff asked, um, that he notes that you served as the acting DNI around the inauguration. I did. Um, do you have any memories from this that you can share? And he wants to know, <laughs> did you move into the boss's office? No, definitely did not move into the boss's office, although we did leave some flowers there to welcome her, but um, <laughs> uh, she was confirmed very quickly. But yes, I did. And I think the memory I have that is um, going to stay with me for a long time is that that day on Inauguration Day, a lot of us were here, obviously essential. We were very concerned about you know, the potential for violence and other things with the transition. And so uh, the the new NSC ran a meeting at, right at noon when they got in. And uh, one of the people on the camera was Lisa Monaco, who I mentioned, who I'm just a huge fan of Lisa's and I've worked with her for many years. And then the two people in the room with me were the acting head of NCTC, like a lifelong friend, Steve Vanage, and the acting head of NCSC, Mike Orlando from FBI Counterintelligence Division, where I spent a large part of my career. And so it was literally me and two people that I respect and uh, just think are the best colleagues. And we were we were there in that moment um trying to add value and and you know use all of these muscles talking to some of the people we were familiar with from long in the past um and i just had an amazing tremendous sense of honor and well-being to be in that situation well that's a great that's a great story laura thank you for sharing that and uh and dean will use that to end our program and uh but i'll give you an opportunity here for any closing thoughts you might have I just want to say to anyone who's listening and is considering a career in the intelligence community, um, especially I can speak to being an analyst because that's what I did. If you have a passion for the story, uh, if you have a passion for these things, this is this is an amazing place to come in and hone a craft 
and the craft is to be objective, to speak truth to power, and to array your thoughts and argumentation and your analysis in a way that's going to help a policymaker tackle the toughest decisions that there are in the national security space. It is a tremendous honor when it is going well. I just don't know that there's anything out there that can be so empowering and invigorating. And I encourage you to consider coming to us, coming to intelligencecareers.gov, uh, coming to ODI and I at some point in your career, wherever your entry point is, um, because this, this work, I promise you, is filled with magic. It's there and you see it every day. Thanks, John. Thank you, Laura. It's been really great to have you this afternoon. Thanks for your candid insights. And to everyone who joined us, thank you for watching online. Um, and once again, thank you to GuideHouse for helping to sponsor this program. Uh, looking ahead, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention for the person who answered the asked the OSINT question. We actually have an OSINT Thinking Outside the SCIF uh, program that's going to be coming up here in the first part of April on the 7th and 8th. We hope you'll be able to join us for that. We've got a really great lineup of speakers. We've got two keynotes, John McLaughlin, the former CIA acting director, and Major General Mary Kate Leahy, who's the assistant, or uh, the Army Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence. We'll be doing some keynotes. We've got panels with experts from FBI, ODNI, DIA, and more. It will be a really great uh, conversation. And on April 22nd, I'd like you to know we're, we'll be hosting the Securing Microelectronic Supply Chains in partnership with the Semiconductor Industry Association. And uh, someone that Laura just mentioned, the Acting Director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, Michael Orlando, will deliver the keynote, followed by a panel discussion about some of the challenges we're facing with the microelectronic supply chain. On the 26th of April, we'll be welcoming NGA's Director, Admiral Sharp, for a leadership luncheon. And then finally, um, we're looking forward to what we have as our inaugural 8A National Security so Showcase. And it's um, just around the corner, uh, fast approaching. It's gonna be held in early June on the 8th and 9th of June. This is gonna provide an opportunity for 8A businesses to showcase their innovative national security technologies, applications, or services. Uh, and to a, a group of prime contractors, venture capitalists, and IC procurement representatives. Um, if you'd like to, if you're an 8A uh, company and you'd like to participate, deadlines are due on March 31st. If you know an 8A company, uh, spread the news, uh, share this with them. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. As always, um, you can find out about all of these activities and more on our website, uh, insaonline.org. All the details are there for you to review. When the webinar ends today, there will be a short survey that pops up. Please take a few minutes to complete it. We read all your surveys, comments, and look forward to that. Uh, this concludes today's program. Stay safe and healthy and have a good afternoon.